Hi, I'm Tom Long, and I want to begin by saying uh, if you missed the last two uh, weekends of my um, island meditations, I apologize. I have been traveling. I went back to West Virginia, and I had the opportunity to preach at the church where my great-grandfather was a pastor back in the early 1900s, and the people of Mount Moriah Baptist Church welcomed us uh, with open arms, and many of my family members were also able to attend and experience what it was like to worship in the same sanctuary as our um, great-grandparents and grandparents had done. And so instead of uh, trying to make up those um, Sundays, I'm just going to share with you uh, the message that I shared with them. And I hope that uh, the Lord will use it to bless you. And I also want to invite you that if you are ever in Tyler County, West Virginia, you make a point to worship with Mount Moriah Baptist Church. Hope you enjoy this message. Uh, you will. Charles is... Uh wife's mother used to teach the Sunday school here. Oh, awesome. Lena's mother, which, and she would have been a second, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. All right. Well, as you already know who I am, oh, you said I'm welcome to use the pulpit, and I'm going to use it for at least a few minutes, and then who knows where I'll go. <laughs> So, as, as Keith was telling you, uh, I'm Tom Long, and my great-grandfather, Charles, is, uh, if you got out here to right where you get through the gate into the cemetery and turn left and start down the hill, there's, there's a couple of Charles Ancrums buried there, uh, the father and son, and an uh, older one that died in 1905 at the age of 28 while pastor of this church. Uh, that's my great grandfather, and um, back in. See, I told myself I wasn't going to get emotional. I'm already doing. I probably got a sentence out. Back in 1971, uh, we came out here for Memorial Day to decorate the gravestones, and that particular Memorial Day, the doors of the church were open. And so, believe it or not, um, I was a teenager then, and that's how you end up being this old later. Um, I was a teenager then, and uh, kind of inquisitive, and Grandma Irene, who was Charles' daughter, was there, and uh, my Aunt Lois, who we call Aunt Oak, uh, who was the church pianist in uh, Anmore, West Virginia, came and sat at the piano, played the piano for a while, and I mean, it was like a revival going on. That, that lady, she she didn't play Sweet Little songs. She had at least a mountain, you know. And uh, I said I was going to run an experiment. I asked Grandma Irene if she would stand at the back of the church, and I would see how softly I could talk. And could she hear me? Can you hear me now? Doing a, a test of the acoustics, you know, because it seemed like it was carrying pretty good. And in the middle of that experiment, my life was changed. <laughs> because as I was standing there talking, if you'd have been here, you wouldn't have heard a word. But I heard a word. I heard the Lord telling me, I want you to stand there and preach my word. That's what I'm calling you to do. And so I thought I was going to be a horse trainer up until that day. <laughs> and then that day I found out that's not what you're going to do. You're going to preach the gospel. And so that happened right here in this church, probably at this very pulpit, in this very place. And so the fact that you would open your doors to me and welcome me back here, what is that, 52 years later, I, I cannot thank you enough 
for this opportunity because I've hit a point in my life. The last fellow that I was filling in, preaching at his church from time to time, he's retired now. And it's occurred to me that this may very well be the last time I stand in a church and, and preach the beautiful words of life that we have in the scriptures. And there's nowhere else I would rather do that than right here. Now, Brother Keith was telling you about how I came out here and I, I flew a drone. And I never got to see the picture from it, by the way, because I lost it before I could take the pictures out. But there's an advantage to flying the drone. So I've been out here before and I've taken pictures. We just took some pictures out there before we came in, get some of the family that we hadn't all been here at the same time before. But the advantage of flying a drone is you get up high and you get the big picture. And so, you know, I, I don't know how many sermons I've preached in my life. There's been several, shall we say, at, at my age. And, and I've taken a little picture of this and I've taken a little picture of that. But today I want to fly the drone over the Bible message. And so what's the big picture? What's, what's this Bible really talking about. And so, um, did everybody bring their sleeping bags? Because, <laughs> you know, we're, I'm, I'm literally going to start at the beginning of the Bible. And, and I, I bet there's probably nobody in here that doesn't know what that verse says. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. So it all starts out with God creating. And then in the second verse, we have the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. So we have God the Creator, God the Spirit. And then you jump to the New Testament. Aren't you glad I didn't do every verse? Of the <laughs> then we jump to the New Testament, to John chapter 1, uh, where we have John's prologue as he's introducing Jesus Christ. And guess how he begins? Same words as Genesis 1, verse 1. He begins with, in the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God. And the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through Him, everything that was made has been made. So, you have the Father involved in creation. You have the Spirit involved in creation. You have the Son involved in creation. God, the three in one, creating us. And... That's pretty unusual and mysterious and hard to wrap your brain around, isn't it? But there's something that comes out of that that's kind of practical. And you figure out what that is when you get down to verse 27, and it says that God created us. He created mankind in his image. Male and female, he created them. And so here's the cool part. This three-in-one God... He created us to be like him. So if we just stop and think for a minute, well, what does that really mean, to be created in the image of God? Did anybody see their image this morning when they were getting ready to come to church? <laughs> Most of us did, and we, uh, I don't know, some of you back there in the back, this really, <laughs> Now, seriously, you know, you look in the mirror, you see your image, a reflection of who you are. That's what we are as human beings. We're a reflection of who God is. So if God is three persons but one being, and we're created in his image, we're made, you're built to be in community. And the last part of community is what? Unity, right? So when you think about whose image we're made in, we're supposed to have unity in the community. And I'm not saying everybody needs to be married. You can be single and still be in community, right? You have a community here. And, and I, I just cannot thank you enough for being stewards of this building where our family has so much history, for being stewards of this property where so many of my ancestors are buried. When you walk out there and you see Ancrums and Sekmans and Showalters, they're all out there. Thank you for taking care of them. But that's community. 
Now, there's another part of this. God is the creator. God the Father is the creator. God the Spirit is the creator. God the Son is the creator. Humans, the images, what are we? We're supposed to be creators. We're supposed to be creating. We're supposed to be building, right? So you begin to get a picture of who we are, what human nature is supposed to be, when you understand who God is. So if you want to understand more about who we are, it would behoove us to learn more about who God is. So one of the words that's used to describe God very frequently in the Bible is holy. Remember Isaiah and Isaiah chapter 6, and he sees the angels, and they're calling out to one another, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. And then if God is holy, which means that he's exalted above us, it also means that he is morally perfect, morally complete. He makes only morally good decisions. And so if we're created in God's image, we're created to do the right thing. We're created to make right choices. Another word that's used to describe God very often is that he is just. And that means that he judges rightly. He doesn't make, he doesn't say, well, you know, Becky's a sweetheart, so yeah, she stabbed Keith, but <laughs> golly, we're just going to let her go. Let's we'll just overlook that, you know. Well, that's not how it works. He's just. So whatever is right is right, whatever is wrong and wrong, and that's how he's going to rule. So, in a way, when you think about it, have you ever studied a culture that didn't have a system of customs, rules of behavior? I bet even when Paul was working with the JCs, they expected you to act a certain way, even, even sometimes maybe to tease each other or, you know, pitch in and help sell those Christmas trees, those kinds of things. Every little group has their ways of doing things, right? And every uh, country has laws. They have law enforcement. They have systems of justice. It all makes sense when you realize that we're created in the image of a just God. Well, that all sounds wonderful. And it's easy to see why one would say that we are uh, fearfully and wonderfully made, because we are all created in God's image. And C.S. Lewis talked about when he was dealing with other people, he, he called it the weight of glory, to realize every person that he was dealing with was made in God's image. So, so far, the Bible is a pretty happy story. But now we get to Genesis chapter 2, don't we? Because the world that you live in, the world that you live in at home, the world that you live in at work, the world that you live in in your community, in your country, did you always do the right thing when you know what to do? I could say that I did, but my wife's here. <laughs> you know, sometimes we know better, and some, for whatever reason, we just don't do it. We don't do the right thing. And can you say that every law is just and even-handed? Can you say that every law is uh, evenly and justly enforced? There, let's face it, there's a, there's a gap, right, between what ought to be and what is. Now, we church people, we've got language for that, right? We call that sin or trespasses or debts, moral debts. And, you know, a lot of times when we use those words, because they have been abused in order to tear people down, people can't receive what we're saying. But I don't know of anybody that would say, yes, the world is ex exactly as it ought to be. We're all just happy with the way everything is going. Everybody's making right decisions. Every government's doing the right thing. It's all just peachy keen. Nobody says that. They might use different words than we church people use, but we all know that there's a dissonance there. And so that brings us to the question of the great American philosopher, Tina Turner. 
<laughs> What's love got to do, got to do with it? Right? We talked about a lot of who God is, but we left out something. Going now into the epistles, we were in the Gospel of John. Now we're going to go to John's first epistle, chapter 4, verses 8 and verse 16. He repeats three words. If you remember nothing from this morning's sermon this week, remember these three words. God is love. God is love. Three times John tells us who God is. God loves us. So, he's just, right? He could have looked down and said, okay, they, they're, not, they're not living the perfect life. There's something different between what ought to be and what is. I'm done with those people, right? He could have done that. Except for that one little hitch. He loved us. <laughs> and so, that's where Jesus comes into the story. Because he loved us, he sent his son in order to be a sacrifice on our behalf so that our punishment could be taken. And I'm going to have to uh, read this one from my notes. I can't remember the exact words here. Um, in John chapter, I'm sorry, Romans chapter 3, and now I can't even find it. Well, anyway, it's, it, the gist of it is that God sent his son to be the sacrifice for our sins so that God could be both just and the justifier. Now, do you know what it means to be justified? I learned this. We sang that little uh, vacation Bible school song earlier, Jesus Loves Me. Justified means it's just as if I had never sinned. It's just as if I was doing what I ought to be doing. In God's eyes, I've been justified because of what Christ did for me. So, now we know that God is love. And we also, anybody, a uh, football fan, anybody watch the game yesterday? Um, we, can, we can all admit to it this week. <laughs> we can't do that every week, but yeah. So, the Mountaineers came out on top. And I'll bet... If you were down there at the University of Central Florida, you'd have seen somebody in the stands with a sign with a scripture reference on it. And then what, what reference would that be? 316. John 316, exactly. Because that is the most famous verse in the New Testament. Because it talks about this love. For God so loved who? The world. He gave his only son his one and only Son, that we shouldn't perish, but have eternal life. <clears throat> so, God loved the world. Now, what planet do we live on? We live in the world. We are the world. And I'm not going to burst into another sentence. <laughs> <laughs> so, sir, what's your name there with the blue shirt? Larry. 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 Larry, you're in the world, right? Yes. You're on. The, you're in this world. You're not an apparition that I'm seeing or anything. You're right here. You're with me. All right? God so loved the world. That means God so loved Larry. Carol. He doesn't call you Uncle Dick. <laughs> God so loved the world means he loves us all. And you know what? The people you don't like, the people you don't want to hang out with, the people you don't want to talk to, he loves them just as much as he loves you. God so loved the world, what did he do about it? He gave his only son, his one and only son, for us. So, now we have an idea of what love is. Right? Right? Love is giving, it's sacrificing, it's serving because you care about somebody. And that brings us down 
It's not going to break out the sleeping bags yet, is it? <laughs> All right. That brings us down to the passage that Keith read for us this morning. The Sadducees, the Pharisees, the Herodians, every which group, as you read through the Gospel of Matthew, every which group has tried to trip Jesus up because he kept going around loving on prostitutes, loving on tax collectors, loving on the, the world, and the religious people and the powerful people did not like that one bit. He was threatening their position of privilege. And so, now the Pharisees were the biggest of the three groups of Jews at that time, and they heard that Jesus had silenced the Sadducees. And so, they, they're like, we got to do something about this dude. He is going to make us look bad and make us lose our power in the community and our prestige. And so they sent one of the experts in the law to try to test him, it says. To tr tr trick him, if you will. And, after, and, he's, and you know how, how people do when they're kind of two-faced? As a teacher, so he addresses him as a rabbi. Teacher. Which is the greatest commandment in the law? And Jesus replied, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. Your heart to the people of that time is where you made moral decisions. Remember, we're made in the image of a holy God. With all your soul. That's the word from which we get the modern word psyche, the, the original Greek word for that. And it meant the breath of God in you that makes you distinctly who you are. All of who you are. See, now, Larry's part of the world, but he doesn't have my psyche. You're very lucky, Larry. <laughs> He's got Larry's psyche. He's unique. But whoever Larry is, whatever makes up Larry's personality, the greatest commandment for Larry is to love God as Larry. Don't do it Tom's way. Do it Larry's way. With all your heart, all your soul, and all your mind. And that word mind there is, a, is again, it's a special word. It has to do with thinking, and it means thinking from one side of the issue to the other. And so you think about God, you think about what he wants us to do, and with your thinking, you love God. So it's an informed, thoughtful way of worshiping God. This is the first and greatest commandment, Jesus says. So, we all know about, you know, the Ten Commandments, but if you go through the Bible from beginning to end and count up the commandments, uh, we're going to need more fingers and toes than we have in a room, right? There's a lot of teaching in there about what we ought to do and ought not to do. But if you want to know the most, first and most important thing, love God. And then he goes on and says, and the second is like it. Love your neighbor, which was, is a word that comes from your nearby person. Love your neighbor as yourself in the same way that you love yourself. Love your neighbor. That's what Jesus is saying. And he's quoting the Old Testament here. It's not, he's not making up you know, new commandments or anything like that. Love your neighbor as yourself. So, if you want to understand, the reason I'm skipping from Genesis chapter 2 to the end of Revelation, in terms of not going through every verse, is because if you want to understand all of that, you've got to understand these two things. Because in the end, he says, all the law on the, and the prophets hang on these two commandments. If you don't understand love God, love others like you love yourself, then you can't understand anything that the Bible has to say to you. Because it all hangs on love. So, if I could give you any gift that I could. It would be the gift of going from this church 
with more love for the Lord, more love for each other, and to realize that's who you were made to be. Someone who loves God, someone who cares, serves, and works for others. So that's what Jesus came to do, to bring us back to what we ought to be, to help us to become more like God, more loving. Because the three words that we want to remember, God is love. May God bless the hearing of his word. May God bless Mount Moriah Baptist Church. May God bless, uh, did I hear that we had some Methodists here today? <laughs> yes, sir. Well, that's, I, I know I've got one of them back here. We got some of the Shirley Methodists? No, it would be Chapel. Oh, okay, very good. All right, excellent. Well, so just so you know, the church where I have been filling in the pulpit is a Methodist church. <laughs> so, uh, in, the, in my home church, Forks and Cheat, we had a, another church, Eden Methodist, down the hill from us, and we would swap where we would do sunrise services with each other. We've always had this wonderful uh, relationship. So I love that we're all here together in this uh, beautiful sanctuary and the beauty is more than the family history for me it's, it's the love and the spirit that you all bring to this place and your service to the mission that so many in my family had when they were part of this place and to think you know that was 1900 and now here we are so many years later and still Loving the Lord, still loving each other. It's it's just it's it's a joy and a treasure for me to, to be here and thank you so much for we having come, me. We come every every fifth Sunday. We join the there the church here. Our church comes. Yes. Yeah. Yes. We, we love it. We come yeah. to mm-hmm. preaching the first two weeks in. Yeah. And they come to our church. Mm-hmm. Well, well I did I did have a, yeah. a closing hymn. And if it's all right with Keith, I'm just going to skip that. Oh, okay. Is that all right? No, go ahead. And so, uh, if, if we can, let's just stand and have a closing word of prayer. Oh. Uh. Father, I thank you for each person that is here. Some who I have... Uh, called by name, and I hope they're not going to be upset with me. And uh, some that I'm just meeting for the first time. And I thank you, Lord, for each one of us that is here. And I pray that as we go from this place, we don't need to remember lessons. We don't need to remember words. We need to remember love. Fill us with your love, Lord. Help us to love the world the way you do. Help us to love each other. Help us to worship, praise, and love you with everything that we have within us. Thank you for the gift of life in Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you all so much for allowing us. Thank you for coming. You certainly brought our numbers up in our (laughs) hearts.